the Dreyfus affair began in the autumn of 1894 when French intelligence realised that someone was passing the German embassy in Paris secret material and they came to the conclusion it was this the one Jew working in the French general staff, Dreyfus. He was sent to Devil's Island. But there was something wrong about it which my hero Picard discovers and um, eventually he leaked what he discovered to sympathetic politician, got into the papers and this thing became the vast um, uh, miscarriage of justice and sensation. Because I mean what was it about the story that really grabbed your attention? First of all the sense of the guy who's promoted into this small intelligence unit who suddenly starts to realise there's something wrong here. Because it obvious to you straight away that it had to be from Picard's point of view. Yes. Um, the thing about the Dreyfus Affair is it went on for 12 years and it became a huge thing about the whole of French society. Uh, and you can just get lost if the, in this if you try to tell the story um, generally. But if you go specifically on one character, then you can bring it down to the essentials. And really, uh, Picard was the man who made the affair happen. Without him, it would never have been exposed. Tell me, what do you make of this Dreyfus business? Distasteful, I reply. Squalid, distracting. I'm glad it's over. Ah, but is it, though? I'm thinking politically here rather than militarily. The Jews are a most persistent race. For them, Dreyfus sitting on his rock is like an aching tooth. It obsesses them. They won't leave it alone. He's an emblem of their shame. But what can they do? I'm not sure, but they'll do something. We may count on that. Bordefra stares over the traffic in the Rue Rabelais and falls silent for a few moments. His profile in the odiferous sunlight is immensely distinguished, carved in flesh by centuries of breeding. I'm reminded of the effigy of a long-suffering Norman knight kneeling in some Bayer chapel. He says thoughtfully, What Dreyfus said to that young captain about not having a motive for treason. I think we ought to be ready with an answer to that. I'd like you to keep the case active. Investigate the family. Feed the file, as your predecessor used to say. See if you can find a little more evidence about motives that we can hold in reserve in case we need it. Yes, of course, General. Did you feel that it was a case with contemporary relevance? Yeah, it's huge contemporary relevance. I didn't set out, to be honest, with that in mind. I thought that it was a great story. I think, you know, frankly, that was my first criteria. But then uh, I realised that there were these huge relevances to our own time. Pico is the uber whistleblower. He's the first great whistleblower. And I watched as I was writing the Snowden revelations and the Manning trial and the, those, uh, the way that they were treated and the similarity to the way that Picard was treated and that age-old dilemma of do you obey your conscience or do you obey your commanding officers. Picard is very dismissive of the kind of, of what he calls the cabalistic power of secret intelligence, the, the persuasive power as well of, of expertise when it's sometimes founded on very little. Is this something that you've seen in observing politicians of, in, in our contemporary era? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think most intelligence is not worthwhile at all. It's a waste of time. Uh, but, um, you know, they love to have it. They love to have, you know, a source in whatever capital is, has told us that. I mean, the only intelligence which is really worth anything, really, is surveillance and, um, and eavesdropping. Um, but all this human intelligence is useless. But, but politicians love it and military people love it. And it's this sense of getting an inside track. And... Um, Picard realises that a lot of what he's doing is completely fraudulent. That afternoon, I write my first secret intelligence report for the general staff, a blanc, as they are known in the Rue Saint-Dominique. I cobble it together from the local German newspapers and from one of the agent's letters that's been left for me. A correspondent from Metz reports that for the last few days there has been great activity among the troops in the Metz garrison. There is no noise and alarm in the city, but the military authorities are pushing the troops intensively. I read it over when I've finished and I ask myself, is this important? Is it even true? Frankly, I haven't the faintest idea. I know only that I am expected to submit a blanc at least once a week and that this is the best I can do for my first attempt. I send it over the road to the Chief of Staff's office, bracing myself for a rebuke for crediting such worthless gossip. Instead, Boisdeffre acknowledges receipt, thanks me, forwards a copy to the head of the infantry, 
I can imagine the conversation in the officers' club. I hear on the grapevine that the Germans are up to something in Metz. And 50,000 troops in the eastern frontier region have their lives made slightly more miserable by several days of additional drills and forced marches. It is my first lesson in the cabalistic power of secret intelligence, two words that can make otherwise sane men abandon their reason and cavort like idiots. The, the novel is full of other novels. It starts off as being, <coughs> as Picard saying, it sounds like something out of Dumas. Yeah. And then later on he decides actually it's more Dostoevskyan. Um, and, and then uh, later on, he even suggests that um, his predicament has taught him that thrillers may sometimes contain more truth than all Monsieur Zola's social realism put together. Well, I couldn't resist that because Pika, uh, w once he was carrying this extraordinary secret around in his head, he was then shipped off to Africa and quite in quite a lot of danger. So he wrote his last will and testament and he wrote a letter to, the, to be owned on the, by the French president and in the event of my death, which is a complete account of the truth and uh, he said you know he says he observes in the book this is like something out of a thriller but his life has become a thriller do you think the literary establishment doesn't take thrillers seriously enough i don't think one wants to be taken i have no desire to be taken seriously by the literary establishment i can't think of anything worse uh, uh, I think that uh, it's a genre that survives, just as detective fiction survives, uh, because it answers a human need uh, for stories and stories about the world around us. And it's simply that thrillers seem to lend themselves particularly well uh, to politics, espionage, warfare and so on. What's it like to sit down and, and write a bestseller? Well, I haven't done it <laughs> for this one yet, so let's wait and see. Uh, You've it's, got well, the uh, weight of expectation from your publishers, from your readership. You've got, I mean, you've sold 10 million copies around that have been translated into 37 languages. Does that change how you sit at the desk and start tapping away at the screen? Oh, it makes it a lot easier, I think, beyond question. First of all, this is my ninth novel, so I've now been over this course nine times. Um, and I, you start to have a faith that you'll get there in the end. I mean, I did, not a word of this book was written before the 15th of January this year. So, I mean, I wrote it at tremendous speed in six months and it's 150,000 words, but I've come to realize that that is the best way to write, actually. It makes you, it, you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see if you've got years and years to, to do something. I think it's like journalism in a way, um, the deadline focuses your mind and you find things you would otherwise miss, I think. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.